The Holy Gospel of Jesus Christ according to Mark The beginning of the Gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God It is written in the prophecy of Isaiah, Behold, I am sending before thee that angel of mine, who is to prepare thy way for thy coming. There is a voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, straighten out his paths. And so it was, that John appeared in the wilderness, baptizing, announcing a baptism whereby men repented to have their sins forgiven. And all the country of Judea, and all those who dwelt in Jerusalem, went out to see him, and he baptized them in the river Jordan, while they confessed their sins. John was clothed with a garment of camel's hair, and had a leather girdle about his loins, and he ate locusts and wild honey. And thus he preached, One is to come after me, who is mightier than I, so that I am not worthy to bend down and untie the strap of his shoes. I have baptized you with water. He will baptize you with the Holy Ghost. At this time, Jesus came from Nazareth and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And even as he came up out of the water, he saw the heavens opened and the Spirit, like a dove, coming down and resting upon him. There was a voice too out of heaven. Thou art my beloved Son, in thee I am well pleased. Thereupon the Spirit sent him out into the desert, and in the desert he spent forty days and forty nights, tempted by the devil. There he lodged with the beasts, and there the angels ministered to him. But when John had been put in prison, Jesus came into Galilee, preaching the gospel of God's kingdom. The appointed time has come, he said, and the kingdom of God is near at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. And as he passed along the sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Simon's brother Andrew casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. Jesus said to them, Come and follow me. I will make you into fishers of men. And they dropped their nets immediately and followed him. Then he went a little further, and saw James, the son of Zebedee, and his brother John. These two were in their boat, repairing their nets. All at once he called them, and they, leaving their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men, turned aside after him. So they made their way to Capernaum. Here, as soon as the Sabbath came, he went into the synagogue and taught. And they were amazed by his teaching for he sat there teaching them like one who had authority, not like the scribes. And there, in the synagogue, was a man possessed by an unclean spirit, who cried aloud, Why dost thou meddle with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Hast thou come to make an end of us? I recognize thee for what thou art, the Holy One of God. Jesus spoke to him threateningly. Silence, he said, come out of him. Then the unclean spirit threw him into a convulsion, and cried with a loud voice, and so came out of him. All were full of astonishment. What can this be? they asked one another. What is this new teaching? See how he has authority to lay his commands even on the unclean spirits, and they obey him. And the story of his doings at once spread through the whole region of Galilee. As soon as they had left the synagogue, they came into Simon and Andrew's house. James and John were with them. The mother of Simon's wife was lying sick there with a fever, and they made haste to tell him of her. Whereupon he went close and took her by the hand and lifted her up, and all at once the fever left her, and she began ministering to them. And when it was evening and the sun went down, they brought to him all those who were afflicted and those who were possessed by devils, so that the whole city stood crowding there at the door. And he healed many that were afflicted with diseases of every sort, and cast out many devils. To the devils he would give no leave to speak, because they recognized him. Then, at very early dawn, he left them, and went away to a lonely place, and began praying there. Simon and his companions went in search of him, and when they found him they told him, All men are looking for thee. And he said to them, 
Let us go to the next country towns, so that I can preach there too. It is for this I have come. So he continued to preach in their synagogues all through Galilee, and cast the devils out. Then a leper came up to him, asking for his aid. He knelt at his feet and said, If it be thy will, thou hast power to make me clean. Jesus was moved with pity. He held out his hand and touched him, and said, It is my will, be thou made clean. And at the word, the leprosy all at once left him, and he was cleansed. And he spoke to him threateningly, and sent him away there and then. Be sure thou dost not speak of this at all, he said, to anyone. Away with thee, show thyself to the priest, and offer the gift of thy cleansing, which Moses ordained, to make the truth known to them. But he, as soon as he had gone away, began to talk publicly and spread the story round, so that Jesus could no longer go into any of the cities openly, but dwelt in lonely places apart, and still from every side they came to him. Then, after some days, he went into Capernaum again, and as soon as word went round that he was in a house there, such a crowd gathered that there was no room left even in front of the door, and he preached the word to them. And now they came to bring a palsied man to him, four of them carrying him at once, and found they could not bring him close to because of the multitude. So they stripped the tiles from the roof over the place where Jesus was and made an opening. Then they let down the bed on which the palsied man lay. And Jesus, seeing their faith, said it to the palsied man, Son, thy sins are forgiven. But there were some of the scribes sitting there who reasoned in their minds, Why does he speak so? He is talking blasphemously. Who can forgive sins but God and God only? Jesus knew at once in his spirit of these secret thoughts of theirs and said to them, Why do you reason thus in your minds? Which command is more likely given? to say to the palsied man, Thy sins are forgiven, or to say, Rise up, take thy bed with thee, and walk. And now, to convince you that the Son of Man has authority to forgive sins while he is on earth, here he spoke to the palsied man, I tell thee, Rise up, take thy bed with thee, and go home. And he rose up at once, and took his bed, and went out in full sight of them, so that all were astonished, and gave praise to God. They said, We never saw the like. Then he went out by the sea again, and all the multitude came to him, and he taught them there. And as he passed further on, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting at work in the customs house, and said to him, Follow me. And he rose up and followed him. And afterwards, when he was taking a meal in his house, Many publicans and sinners were at table with Jesus and his disciples, for there were many of these who followed him. Thereupon the scribes and Pharisees, seeing him eat with publicans and sinners in his company, asked his disciples, How comes it that your master eats and drinks with publicans and sinners? Jesus heard it and said to them, It is not those who are in health that have need of the physician, it is those who are sick. I have come to call sinners not the just. John's disciples and the Pharisees used to fast at that time. And they came and said to him, How is it that thy disciples do not fast when John's disciples and the Pharisees fast? To them Jesus said, Can you expect the men of the bridegroom's company to go fasting while the bridegroom is still with them? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot be expected to fast. But the days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them. Then they will fast when that day comes. Nobody sews on a piece of new cloth to patch an old cloak. If that is done, the new piecing takes away threads from the old cloth and makes the rent in it worse. Nor does anybody put new wine into old wineskins. If that is done, the wine bursts the skins, and there is the wine spilt and the skins spoiled. New wine must be put into fresh wineskins. It happened that he was walking through the cornfields on the Sabbath day, 
and his disciples fell to plucking the ears of corn as they went. And the Pharisees said to him, Look, why are they doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath? Whereupon he said to them, Have you never read of what David did, when he and his followers were hard put to it for hunger, how he went into the tabernacle when Abiathar was high priest, and ate the loaves set forth there before God, which only the priests may eat, and gave them besides to those who were with him? And he told them, The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath, so that the Son of Man has even the Sabbath at his disposal. And once more he went into a synagogue, and there was a man there who had one of his hands withered. And they were watching him to see whether he would do a work of healing on the Sabbath, so that they might have a charge to bring against him. So he said to the man who had his hand withered, Rise up and come forward. Then he said to them, Which is right, to do good on the Sabbath day or to do harm, to save life or to make away with it? And they sat there in silence. And he looked round on them in anger, grieved at the hardness of their hearts, and said to the man, Stretch out thy hand. He stretched it out, and his hand was restored to him. Then the Pharisees went out, and at once began plotting with those who were of Herod's party to make away with him. But Jesus withdrew with his disciples towards the sea, and great crowds followed him from Galilee and from Judea and from Jerusalem and from Idumea and from beyond Jordan and those who lived about Tyre and Sidon, hearing of all that he did, came in great numbers to him. So he told his disciples to keep a boat ready at need because of the multitude, for fear they should press on him too close. For he did many works of healing, so that all those who were visited with suffering thrust themselves upon him to touch him. The unclean spirits too, whenever they saw him, used to fall at his feet and cry out, Thou art the Son of God, and he would give them a strict charge not to make him known. Then he went up onto the mountainside and called to him those whom it pleased him to call. So these came to him, and he appointed twelve to be his companions, and to go out preaching at his command, with power to cure diseases and to cast out devils. To Simon he gave the fresh name of Peter. To James the son of Zebedee and his brother John he gave the fresh name of Bernerges, that is, sons of thunder. The others were Andrew and Philip and Bartholomew and Matthew and Thomas and James the son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus and Simon the Cananean and Judas Iscariot the traitor. And now they came into a house, and once more the multitude gathered, so that they had no room even to sit and eat. When word came to those who were nearest him, they went out to restrain him. They said, He must be mad. And the scribes who had come down from Jerusalem said, He is possessed by Beelzebub. It is through the prince of the devils that he cast the devils out. So he called them to him and spoke to them in parables. How can it be Satan who casts Satan out? Why, if a kingdom is at war with itself, that kingdom cannot stand firm. And if a household is at war with itself, that household cannot stand firm. If Satan, then, has risen up in arms against Satan, he is at war with himself. He cannot stand firm. His end has come. No one can enter into a strong man's house and plunder his goods without first making the strong man his prisoner. Then he can plunder his house at will. Believe me, there's pardon for all the other sins of mankind and the blasphemies they utter. But if a man blasphemes against the Holy Spirit, there is no pardon for him in all eternity. He is guilty of a sin which is eternal. This was because they were saying he has an unclean spirit. Then his mother and his brethren came and sent a message to him, calling him to them while they stood without. There was a multitude sitting round him when they told him, Behold, thy mother and thy brethren are without, looking for thee. And he answered them, Who is a mother? Who are brethren to me? Then he looked about at those who were sitting around him, and said, Here are my mother and my brethren. If anyone does the will of God, he is my brother and sister and mother. Then 
Then he began to teach by the seaside again, and a great multitude gathered before him, so that he went into a boat and sat there on the sea, while all the multitude was on the land at the sea's edge. And he taught them for a long time, but in parables. Listen, his teaching began, here is the sower gone out to sow. And as he sowed, some grains chanced to fall beside the path, so that the birds came and ate them up. And others fell on rocky land, where the soil was shallow. These sprang up all at once, because they had not sunk deep in the ground. And when the sun rose, they were parched, they had taken no root, and so they withered away. Some fell among briars, so that the briars grew up and smothered them, and they gave no crop. And others fell where the soil was good, and these sprouted and grew, and yielded a harvest, some of them thirtyfold, some sixtyfold, some a hundredfold. Listen, he said, you that have ears to hear with. When they could speak with him alone, the twelve who were with him asked the meaning of the parable. And he said to them, It is granted to you to understand the secret of God's kingdom. For those others who stand without, all is parable. So they must watch and watch, yet never see, must listen and listen, yet never understand, nor ever turn back and have their sins forgiven them. Then he said to them, You do not understand this parable, and are these the men who are to understand all parables? What the sower sows is the word. Those by the wayside are those who have the word sown in them, but no sooner have they heard it than Satan comes and takes away this word that was sown in their hearts. In the same way, those who take in the seed in rocky ground are those who entertain the word with joy as soon as they hear it, and yet have no root in themselves. They last for a time, but afterwards, when tribulation or persecution arises over the word, their faith is soon shaken. And there are others who take in the seed in the midst of thorns. They are those who hear the word, but allow the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches and their other appetites to smother the word so that it remains fruitless. And those who take in the seed in good soil are those who hear the word and welcome it and yield a harvest, one grain thirtyfold, one sixtyfold, one a hundredfold. And he said to them, Is a lamp brought in to be put under a bushel measure or under a bed? not in the lampstand. What is hidden is hidden only so that it may be revealed. What is kept secret is kept secret only that it may come to light. Listen, all you that have ears to hear with. And he said to them, Look well what it is that you hear. The measure in which you give is the measure in which you will be repaid, and more will be given you besides. If a man is rich, gifts will be made to him. If he is poor, even the little he has will be taken away from him. And he said to them, The kingdom of heaven is like this. It's as if a man should sow a crop in his land, and then go to sleep and wake again, night after night, day after day, while the crop sprouts and grows, without any knowledge of his. So of its own accord the ground heals increase, first the blade, then the ear, then the perfect grain in the ear. And when the fruit appears, then it is time for him to put in the sickle, because now the harvest is ripe. And he said, What likeness can we find for the kingdom of God? To what image are we to compare it? To a grain of mustard seed. When this is sown in the earth, no seed on earth is so little. But once sown, it shoots up and grows taller than any garden herb, putting out great branches so that all the birds can come and settle under its shade. And he used many parables of this kind, such as they could listen to easily, in preaching the word to them. To them he spoke only in parables, and made all plain to his disciples when they were alone. That day, when evening came on, he said to them, Let us go across to the other side. So they let the multitude go, and took him with them, just as he was on the boat. There were other boats too with him. And a great storm of wind arose and drove the waves into the boat so that the boat could hold no more. Meanwhile, he was in the stern, asleep on the pillow there. 
and they roused him, crying, Master, art thou unconcerned? We are sinking. So he rose up and checked the wind, and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind dropped, and there was deep calm. Then he said to them, Why are you so faint-hearted? Have you still no faith? And they were overcome with awe. Why, who is this, they said to one another, who is obeyed even by the winds and the sea? So they came to the further shore of the sea, in the country of the Gerasenes. And as soon as he had disembarked, a man, possessed by an unclean spirit, came out of the rock tombs to meet him. This man made his dwelling among the tombs, and nobody could keep him bound any longer, even with chains. He had been bound with fetters and chains often before, but had torn the chains apart and broken the fetters, and nobody had the strength to control him. Thus he spent all his time, night and day, among the tombs and the hills, crying aloud and cutting himself with stones. When he saw Jesus from far off, he ran up and fell at his feet, and cried with a loud voice, Why dost thou meddle with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I adjure thee in God's name, do not torment me. For he was saying, Come out of the man, thou unclean spirit. Then he asked him, What is thy name? The spirit told him, My name is Legion, there are many of us. And it was full of entreaties that he would not send them away out of the country. There, at the foot of the mountain, was a great herd of swine feeding. And the devils entreated him, Send us into the swine, let us make our lodging there. With that, Jesus gave them leave, and the unclean spirits came out and went into the swine, whereupon the herd rushed down at full speed into the sea, some two thousand in number, and the sea drowned them. The swine herds fled, and told their news in the city and in the countryside, so that they came out to see what had befallen. And when they reached Jesus, they found the possessed man sitting there, clothed and restored to his wits, and they were overcome with fear. Then those who had seen it told them the story of the possessed man and what had happened to the swine. Whereupon they began entreating him to leave their country. So he embarked on the boat, and as he did so, the man who had been possessed was eager to go with him. But Jesus would not give him leave. Go home to thy friends, he said, and tell them all that the Lord has done for thee, and what great mercy he showed thee. So he went back, and began to spread word in Decapolis of what Jesus had done for him, and all wondered at it. So Jesus went back by boat across the sea, and a great multitude gathered about him. And while he was still by the sea, one of the rulers of the synagogue came up, Jairus by name, and fell down at his feet when he saw him, pleading for his aid. My daughter, he said, is at the point of death. Come and lay thy hand on her, that she may recover and live. So he turned aside with him, and a great multitude followed him, and pressed close upon him. And now a woman, who for twelve years had had an issue of blood, and had undergone much from many physicians, spending all she had on them, and no better for it, but rather grown worse, came up behind Jesus in the crowd, for she had been told of him, and touched his cloak. If I can even touch his cloak, she said to herself, I shall be healed. And immediately the source of the bleeding dried up, and she felt in her body that she had been cured of her affliction. Jesus thereupon, inwardly aware of the power that had proceeded from him, turned back towards the multitude and asked, Who touched my garments? His disciples said to him, Canst thou see the multitude pressing so close about thee and ask, Who touched me? But he looked round him to catch sight of the woman who had done this. And now the woman, trembling with fear, since she recognized what had befallen her, came and fell at his feet and told him the whole truth. Whereupon Jesus said to her, My daughter, thy faith has brought thee recovery. Go in peace, and be rid of thy affliction. While he was yet speaking, messengers came from the ruler's house to say, Thy daughter is dead. 
Why dost thou trouble the master any longer? Jesus heard the word and told the ruler of the synagogue, No need to fear, thou hast only to believe. And now he would not let anyone follow him except Peter and James and James' brother John. And so they came to the ruler's house, where he found a great stir and much weeping and lamentation. And he went in and said to them, What is this stir, this weeping? The child is not dead, she is asleep. They laughed aloud at him. But he sent them all out, and taking the child's father and mother and his own companions with him, went in to where the child lay. Then he took hold of the child's hand and said to her, Talitha kumi, which means, Maiden, I say to thee, rise up. And the girl stood up immediately and began to walk. She was twelve years old, and they were beside themselves with wonder. Then he laid a strict charge on them to let nobody hear of this, and ordered that she should be given something to eat. Then he left the place and withdrew to his own countryside, his disciples following him. Here, when the Sabbath came, he began teaching in the synagogue, and many were astonished when they heard him. How did he come by all this, they asked. What is the meaning of this wisdom that's been given him, of all these wonderful works that are done by his hands? Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon? Do not his sisters live here near us? And they had no confidence in him. Then Jesus said to them, It's only in his own country, in his own home, and among his own kindred, that a prophet goes unhonored. Nor could he do any wonderful works there, except that he laid his hands on a few who were sick and cured them. He was astonished at their unbelief. And so he went on round about the villages, preaching. And now he called the twelve to him, and began sending them out, two and two, giving them authority over the unclean spirits. And he gave them instructions to take a staff for their journey, and nothing more, no wallet, no bread, no money for their purses, to be shod with sandals, and not to wear a second coat. You are to lodge, he told them, in the house you first enter, until you leave the place. And wherever they give you no welcome and no hearing, shake off the dust from beneath your feet in witness against them. So they went out and preached, bidding men repent. They cast out many devils, and many who were sick they anointed with oil and healed them. Then, as his name grew better known, King Herod came to hear of it. It is John the Baptist, he said, risen from the dead, and that is why these powers are active in him. Others were saying, It's Elias, and others, It is a prophet, like one of the old prophets. But when Herod was told it, he declared, He has risen from the dead, John the Baptist, whom I beheaded. Herod himself had sent and arrested John, and put him in prison, in chains, for love of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, whom he had married. Because John had told Herod, It is wrong for thee to take thy brother's wife. Herodias was always plotting against him, and would willingly have murdered him, but could not, because Herod was afraid of John, recognizing him for an upright and holy man, so that he kept him carefully, and followed his advice in many things, and was glad to listen to him. And now came a fitting occasion, upon which Herod gave a birthday feast to his lords and officers, and to the chief men of Galilee. Herodias' own daughter came in and danced, and gave such pleasure to Herod and his guests, that the king said to the girl, Ask me for whatever thou wilt, and thou shalt have it. He even bound himself by an oath, I will grant whatever request thou makest, though it were a half of my kingdom. Thereupon she went out and said to her mother, What shall I ask for? And she answered, The head of John the Baptist. With that she hastened into the king's presence and made her request. My will is, she said, that thou shouldst give me the head of John the Baptist. Give it me now, on a dish. And the king was full of remorse, but out of respect to his oath and to those who sat with him at table, he would not disappoint her. So he sent one of his guard with orders that the head should be brought on a dish. This soldier cut off his head in the prison and brought it on a dish 
and gave it to the girl, and the girl gave it to her mother. When John's disciples heard of it, they came and carried off his body and laid it in a tomb. And now the apostles came together in the presence of Jesus and told him of all they had done and all the teaching they had given. And he said to them, Come away into a quiet place by yourselves and rest a little. For there were many coming and going, and they scarcely had leisure even to eat. So they took ship and went to a lonely place by themselves. But many saw them going, or came to know of it. Gathering from all the cities, they hurried to the place by land, and were there before them. So when he disembarked, Jesus saw a great multitude there, and took pity on them, since they were like sheep that have no shepherd, and began to give them long instruction. And when it was already late, his disciples came to him and said, This is a lonely place, and it is late already. Give them leave to go to the farms and villages round about, and buy themselves food there. They have nothing to eat. But he answered them, It is for you to give them food to eat. Why then, they said to him, we must go and spend two hundred silver pieces buying bread to feed them. He asked, How many loaves have you? Go and see. When they'd found out, they told him five and two fishes. Then he told them all to sit down in companies on the green grass, and they took their places in rows by hundreds and fifties. And he took the five loaves and the two fishes and looked up to heaven and blessed and broke the loaves and gave these to his disciples to set before them, dividing the fishes too among them all. All ate and had enough, and when they took up the broken pieces and what was left of the fishes, they filled twelve baskets with them. The loaves had fed five thousand men. As soon as this was done, he prevailed upon his disciples to take ship and cross to Bethsaida on the other side before him, leaving him to send the multitude home. And when he taken leave of them, he went up onto the hillside to pray there. Twilight had already come, and the boat was halfway across the sea, while he was on the shore alone. And when the night had reached its fourth quarter, seeing them hard put to it with rowing, for the wind was against them, he came to them, walking on the sea, and made as if to pass them by. When they saw him walking on the sea, they thought it was an apparition, and cried aloud, for all had seen him, and were full of dismay. But now he spoke to them, Take courage, he said, it is myself, do not be afraid. So he came to them on board the boat, and thereupon the wind dropped, and they were astonished out of all measure. They had not grasped the lesson of the loaves, so dulled were their hearts. When they had crossed, they came to shore at Gennesareth and moored there. As soon as they had disembarked, he was recognized, and they ran off into all the country round, and began bringing the sick after him, beds and all, wherever they heard he was. And wherever he entered villages or farmsteads or towns, they used to lay the sick down in the open streets, and beg him to let them touch even the hem of his cloak. And all those who touched him recovered. Then the Pharisees and some of the scribes who come from Jerusalem gathered round him, and these found fault, because they saw that some of his disciples sat down to eat with their hands defiled, that is, unwashed. For the Pharisees, and indeed all the Jews, holding to the tradition of their ancestors, never eat without washing their hands again and again. They will not sit down to meat coming from the market without thorough cleansing, and there are many other customs which they hold to by tradition, purifying of cups and pitchers and pans and beds. So the Pharisees and scribes asked him, Why do thy disciples eat with defiled hands, instead of following the tradition of our ancestors? But he answered, You hypocrites! It was a true prophecy Isaiah made of you, writing as he did, This people does me honour with its lips, but its heart is far from me. Their worship of me is vain, for the doctrines they teach are the commandments of men. 
You leave God's commandment on one side and hold to the tradition of man, the purifying of pitchers and cups and many other like observances. And he told them, You have quite defeated God's commandment to establish your own tradition instead. Moses said, Honor thy father and thy mother, and he who curses father or mother dies without hope of reprieve. But you say, Let a man tell his father or his mother, All the money out of which you might get help from me is now Corban, that is, an offering to God, and then you will not let him do any more for father or mother. With this and many like observances, you are making God's law ineffectual through the tradition you have handed down. And he called the multitude to him and said to them, Listen to me, all of you, and grasp this. Nothing that finds its way into a man from outside can make him unclean. What makes a man unclean is what comes out of a man. Listen, you that have ears to hear with. When he had gone into the house, away from the multitude, his disciples asked him the meaning of the parable. And he said to them, Are you still so slow of wit? Do you not observe that all the uncleanness which goes into a man has no means of defiling him, because it travels not into his heart, but into the belly, and so finds its way into the sewer? Thus he declared all meat to be clean, and told them that what defiles a man is that which comes out of him. For it is from within, from the hearts of men, that their wicked designs come, their sins of adultery, fornication, murder, theft, covetousness, malice, deceit, lasciviousness, envy, blasphemy, pride, and folly. All these evils come from within, and it's these which make a man unclean. After this, Jesus left those parts and withdrew into the neighborhood of Tyre and Sidon. There he went into a house and did not wish anyone to know of it. But he could not go unrecognized, for a woman came to hear of it whose daughter was possessed by an unclean spirit, and she came in and fell at his feet. This woman was a Gentile, a Syrophoenician by race, and she begged him to cast the devil out of her daughter. But he said to her, Let the children have their fill first. It's not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. She answered him, Ah, yes, Lord, the dogs eat of the crumbs the children leave underneath the table. And he said to her, In reward for this word of thine, back home with thee, the devil has left thy daughter. And when she came back to her house, she found her daughter lying on the bed, and the devil gone. Then he set out again from the region of Tyre, and came by way of Sidon to the Sea of Galilee, right into the region of Decapolis. And they brought to him a man who was deaf and dumb, with a prayer that he would lay his hand upon him. And he took him aside out of the multitude. He put his fingers into his ears, and spat and touched his tongue. Then he looked up to heaven and sighed. Ephata, he said, that is, be opened. Whereupon his ears were opened, and the bond which tied his tongue was loosed, and he talked plainly. And he laid a strict charge on them, not to speak of it to anyone. But the more he charged them, the more widely they published it and were more than ever astonished. He has done well, they said, in all his doings. He has made the deaf hear and the dumb speak. Once more at this time, the multitude had grown in numbers and had nothing to eat. And he called his disciples to him and said to them, I am moved with pity for the multitude. It is three days now since they have been in attendance on me, and they have nothing to eat. If I send them back to their homes fasting, they will grow faint on their journey. Some of them have come from far off. His disciples answered him, How could anyone find bread to feed them here in the desert? And he asked them, How many loaves have you? Seven, they said. And he gave word to the multitude to sit down on the ground. Then he took the seven loaves, and when he had blessed and broken, he gave these to his disciples to set before them. So they set them before the multitude. And they had a few small fishes. These he blessed, and ordered that these two should be set before them. 
and they ate and had enough. When they picked up what was left of the broken pieces, it filled seven hampers. About four thousand had eaten, and so he sent them home. Thereupon he embarked with his disciples and went into the part round Dalmanutha. Here the Pharisees came out and entered upon a dispute with him. To put him to the test, they asked him to show them a sign from heaven. And he sighed deeply in his spirit and said, Why does this generation ask for a sign? Believe me, this generation shall have no sign given it. And so he left them and took ship again and crossed to the further side. They had forgotten to take bread with them and had no more than one loaf in the boat. And when he warned them, Look well and avoid the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod, they said anxiously to one another, We have brought no bread. Let me put a little note in there, please. When our Lord warns his apostles of the leaven of the Pharisees, he means the corrupting influence of their religious attitudes. The Jews regarded fermentation as a kind of corruption, and so the leaven of the Pharisees could be their hypocrisy, their being very concerned with the externals of religion, but little concerned with the interior spirit. And the leaven of Herod could be the spirit of worldliness, preoccupation with pleasure and political ambition. I'll go back to the text. And when he warned them, Look well, and avoid the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod, they said anxiously to one another, We have brought no bread. Jesus knew it and said, What is this anxiety that you have brought no bread with you? Have you no sense, no wits, even now? Is your heart still dull? Have you eyes that cannot see and ears that cannot hear? Do you remember nothing? When I broke the five loaves among the five thousand, how many baskets full of broken pieces did you take up? They told him, Twelve. And when I broke the seven loaves among the four thousand, how many hampers full of broken pieces did you take up then? And they told him, Seven. Then he said to them, How is it that you still do not understand? So they came to Bethsaida, and they brought to him a blind man whom they entreated him to touch. He took the blind man by the hand, and led him outside the village. Then he spat into his eyes and laid his hands on him and asked him if he could see anything. He looked up and said, I can see men as if they were trees but walking. Once more Jesus laid his hands upon his eyes and he began to see right. And soon he recovered so that he could see everything clearly. Then he sent him back to his house. Go home, he said, and if thou shouldst enter the village, do not tell any one of it. Then Jesus went with his disciples into the villages round Caesarea Philippi. And on the way he asked his disciples, Who do men say that I am? They answered, John the Baptist, and others say Elias, others that thou art like one of the prophets. Then he said to them, And what of you? Who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, Thou art the Christ. And he strictly charged them, not to tell anyone about him. Let me put in Monsignor Knox's footnote. St. Mark omits here the promises made to St. Peter, perhaps because St. Peter forbade it out of humility, perhaps because writing, like St. Luke at Rome, he was unwilling to draw attention to the Apostle's prominence in the Church for fear of persecution arising. I go back to the text and he strictly charged them not to tell anyone about him. And now he began to make it known to them that the Son of Man must be much ill-used and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be put to death and rise again after three days. This he told them openly. Whereupon Peter, drawing him to his side, fell to reproaching him. But he turned about and seeing his disciples there, rebuked Peter. Back, Satan, he said, these thoughts of thine are man's, not God's. Can I put a footnote in there, please, too? 
Immediately after the apostles realized that our Lord was indeed the Messiah, our Lord began to foretell his passion. This would serve as a speedy corrective to any false messianic hopes they might have. In St. Peter's reproach to our Lord, he was in a way renewing Satan's temptation, and so he shared Satan's rebuke. St. Peter's thoughts were not in harmony with the divine plan. I go back to the text. And he called his disciples to him, and the multitude with him, and said to them, If any man has a mind to come my way, let him renounce self, and take up his cross, and follow me. The man who tries to save his life will lose it. It is the man who loses his life for my sake, and for the gospel's sake, that will save it. How is a man the better for it, if he gains the whole world at the expense of losing his own soul? For a man's soul, what price can be high enough? If anyone is ashamed of acknowledging me and my words before this unfaithful and wicked generation, the Son of Man, when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels, will be ashamed to acknowledge him. Believe me, there are those standing here who will not taste of death before they have seen the kingdom of God present in all its power. Six days afterwards, Jesus took Peter and James and John with him and led them up to a high mountain where they were alone by themselves and he was transfigured in their presence. His garments became bright, dazzling white like snow, white as no fuller here on earth could have made them. And they had sight of Elias with Moses. These two were conversing with Jesus. Then Peter said aloud to Jesus, Master, it is well that we should be here. Let us make three arbors, one for thee, and one for Moses, and one for Elias. He did not know what to say, for they were overcome with fear. And a cloud formed, overshadowing them, and from the cloud came a voice which said, This is my beloved Son. To him then listen. Then on a sudden they looked round them and saw no one any more, but Jesus only with them. And as they were coming down from the mountain, he warned them not to tell anyone what they had seen until after the Son of Man had risen from the dead. So they kept the matter to themselves, wondering what the words could mean when he is risen from the dead. And they asked him, Tell us, why do the Pharisees and scribes say Elias must come before Christ? He answered them, Elias must needs come and restore all things as they were. And now what is written of the Son of Man, that he must be much ill-used and despised. Elias too, I tell you, has already come, and they have misused him at their pleasure, as the Scriptures tell of him. I'll just make a note there. Elsewhere, as St. Matthew tells us, our Lord had already said that John the Baptist had fulfilled the prophecy about Elias coming again, not, of course, by personal identity, but in spirit and in power. I go back to the text. When he reached his disciples, he found a great multitude gathered round them, and some of the scribes disputing with them. The multitude, as soon as they saw him, were overcome with awe and ran up to welcome him. He asked them, What is the dispute you are holding among you? And one of the multitude answered, Master, I have brought my son to thee. He is possessed by a dumb spirit, and wherever it seizes on him, it tears him, and he foams at the mouth, and gnashes his teeth, and his strength is drained from him. And I bade thy disciples cast it out, but they were powerless. And he answered them, Ah, faithless generation, how long must I be with you? How long must I bear with you? Bring him to me. So they brought the boy to him, and the evil spirit, as soon as it saw him, threw the boy into a convulsion, so that he fell on the ground, writhing and foaming at the mouth. And now Jesus asked the father, How long has this been happening to him? From childhood, he said, and often it's thrown him into the fire and into water to make an end of him. Come, have pity on us, and help us if thou canst. 
But Jesus said to him, If thou canst believe, to him who believes, everything is possible. Whereupon the father of the boy cried aloud in tears, Lord, I do believe. Succor my unbelief. And Jesus, seeing how the multitude was gathering round them, rebuked the unclean spirit. Thou dumb and deaf spirit, he said, it is I that command thee. Come out of him, and never enter into him again. With that, crying aloud and throwing him into a violent convulsion, he came out of him, and he lay there like a corpse, so that many declared, He's dead. But Jesus took hold of his hand, and raised him, and he stood up. When he had gone into a house, and they were alone, the disciples asked him, Why was it that we could not cast it out? And he told them, There is no way of casting out such spirits as this, except by prayer and fasting. Then they left those parts, and passed straight through Galilee, and he would not let anyone know of his passage. He spent the time teaching his disciples. The Son of Man, he said, is to be given up into the hands of men. They will put him to death, and he will rise again on the third day. But they could not understand his meaning, and were afraid to ask him. So they came to Capernaum, and there, when they were in the house, he asked them, what was the dispute you were holding on the way? They said nothing, for they had been disputing among themselves which should be the greatest of them. Then he sat down and called the twelve to him and said, If anyone has a mind to be the greatest, he must be the last of all and the servant of all. And he took a little child and gave it a place in the midst of them and said to them, Whoever welcomes such a child as this in my name welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me welcomes not me, but him that sent me. And John answered him, Master, we saw a man who does not follow in our company casting out devils in thy name, and we forbade him to do it. But Jesus said, Forbid him no more. No one who does a miracle in my name will lightly speak evil of me. The man who is not against you is on your side. Why, if anyone gives you a cup of water to drink in my name, because you are Christ's, I promise you, he shall not miss his reward. And if anyone hurts the conscience of one of these little ones that believe in me, he'd better have been cast into the sea with a millstone about his neck. If thy hand is an occasion of falling to thee, cut it off. Better for thee to enter into life maimed than to have two hands when thou goest into hell into unquenchable fire. The worm which eats them there never dies, the fire is never quenched. And if thy foot is an occasion of falling to thee, cut it off. Better for thee to enter into eternal life lame than to have both feet when thou art cast into the unquenchable fire of hell. The worm which eats them there never dies, the fire is never quenched. And if thy eye is an occasion of falling, pluck it out. Better for thee to enter blind into the kingdom of God than to have two eyes when thou art cast into the fire of hell. The worm which eats them there never dies. The fire is never quenched. Fire will be every man's seasoning. Every victim must be seasoned with salt. Salt is a good thing, but if the salt becomes tasteless, what will you use to season it with? You must have salt in yourselves and keep peace among you. I'll add a little note there. The imagery our Lord used is based on the idea of salt as seasoning and as a symbol of friendship. Among the Jews, a covenant of salt was a perpetual covenant. Removing thence, he entered the territory of Judea, which lies beyond the Jordan. Multitudes gathered round him once more, and once more he began to teach them, as his custom was. Then the Pharisees came and put him to the test by asking him whether it is right for a man to put away his wife. He answered them, What command did Moses give you? And they said, Moses left a man free to put his wife away if he gave her a rish of separation. Jesus answered them, It was to suit your hard hearts 
that Moses wrote such a command as that. God, from the first days of creation, made them man and woman. A man, therefore, will leave his father and mother and will cling to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. Why then, since they are no longer two, but one flesh, what God has joined together, let not man put asunder. And when they were in the house, his disciples asked him further about the same question, whereupon he told them, If a man puts away his wife and marries another, he behaves adulterously towards her. And if a woman puts away her husband and marries another, she is an adulteress. Then they brought children to him, asking him to touch them, and his disciples rebuked those who brought them. But Jesus was indignant at seeing this. Let the children come to me, he said, do not keep them back. The kingdom of God belongs to such as these. I tell you truthfully, the man who does not welcome the kingdom of God like a child will never enter into it. And so he embraced them, laid his hands upon them, and blessed them. Then he went out to continue his journey. And a man ran up and knelt down before him, asking him, Master, who art so good, what must I do to achieve eternal life? Jesus said to him, Why dost thou call me good? None is good except God only. Thou knowest the commandments, Thou shalt not commit adultery, Thou shalt do no murder, Thou shalt not steal, Thou shalt not bear false witness, Thou shalt not wrong any man, Honour thy father and thy mother. Master, he answered, I have kept all these ever since I grew up. Then Jesus fastened his eyes on him and conceived a love for him. In one thing he said, Thou art still wanting. Go home and sell all that belongs to thee. Give it to the poor, and so the treasure thou hast shall be in heaven. Then come back and follow me. At this his face fell, and he went away sorrowing, for he had great possessions. And Jesus looked round and said to his disciples, With what difficulty will those who have riches enter God's kingdom? The disciples were amazed at his words, but Jesus gave them a second answer, My children, how hard it is for those who trust in riches to enter God's kingdom. It's easier for a camel to pass through a needle's eye than for a man to enter the kingdom of God when he is rich. They were still more astonished. Why then, they said to themselves, who can be saved? Jesus fastened his eyes on them and said, Such things are impossible to man's bowels, but not to God's. To God all things are possible. Hereupon Peter took occasion to say, What of us who have forsaken all and followed thee? Jesus answered, I promise you, everyone who has forsaken home, or brothers, or sisters, or mother, or children, or lands for my sake, and for the sake of the gospel, will receive now in this world a hundred times their worth, houses, sisters, brothers, mothers, children, and lands, but with persecution, and in the world to come he will receive everlasting life. But many will be first that were last, and last that were first. And now they were on their way going up to Jerusalem, and still Jesus led them on, while they were bewildered and followed him with faint hearts. Then once more he brought the twelve apostles to his side and began to tell them what was to befall him. Now we are going up to Jerusalem, and there the Son of Man will be given up into the hands of the chief priests and scribes, who will condemn him to death, and these will give him up into the hands of the Gentiles, who will mock him and spit upon him and scourge him and kill him. But on the third day he will rise again. Thereupon James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him and said, Master, we would have thee grant the request we are to make. And he asked them, What would you have me do for you? They said to him, Grant that one of us may take his place on thy right and the other on thy left when thou art glorified. But Jesus said to them, You do not know what it is you ask. Have you strength to drink of the cup I am to drink of? 
to be baptized with a baptism I am to be baptized with? They said to him, We have. And Jesus told them, You shall indeed drink of the cup I am to drink of, and be baptized with a baptism I am to be baptized with. But a place on my right hand or my left is not mine to give you. It is for those for whom it has been destined. The ten others grew indignant with James and John when they heard of it. But Jesus called them to him and said to them, You know that among the Gentiles, those who claim to bear rule lord it over them, and those who are great among them make the most of the power they have. With you it must be otherwise. Whoever has a mind to be great among you must be your servant, and whoever has a mind to be first among you must be your slave. So it is that the Son of Man did not come to have service done him. He came to serve others and to give his life as a ransom for the lives of many. And now they reached Jericho. And as he was leaving Jericho with his disciples and with a great multitude, Bartimaeus, the blind man, Timaeus his son, was sitting there by the wayside begging. And hearing that this was Jesus of Nazareth, he fell to crying out, Jesus, son of David, have pity on me. Many of them rebuked him and told him to be silent, but he cried out all the more, Son of David, have pity on me. Jesus stopped and bade them summon him. So they summoned the blind man. Take heart, they said, and rise up. He is summoning thee. Whereupon he threw away his cloak and leapt to his feet and so came to Jesus. Then Jesus answered him, What wouldst thou have me do for thee? And the blind man said to him, Lord, give me back my sight. Jesus said to him, Away home with thee, thy faith has brought thee recovery. And all at once he recovered his sight and followed Jesus on his way. When they were approaching Jerusalem and Bethany, which is close to Mount Olivet, he sent two of his disciples on an errand. Go into the village that faces you, he told them, and the first thing you will find there upon entering will be a colt tethered, one on which no man has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it to me. And if anyone asks you, why are you doing that, tell him the Lord has need of it, and he will let you have it without more ado. So they went and found the colt tethered before a door at the entrance, and they untied it. Some of the bystanders asked them, What are you doing, untying the colt? And they answered them as Jesus had bidden, and were allowed to take it. So they brought the colt to Jesus, and saddled it with their garments, and he mounted it. Many of them spread their garments in the way, and others strewed the way with leaves they had cut down from the trees. And those who went before him and followed after him cried aloud, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the kingdom of our father David which is coming to us. Hosanna in heaven above. So he came to Jerusalem and went into the temple where he surveyed all that was about him. And then, for the hour was already late, went out with the twelve to Bethany. When they had left Bethany next day, he was hungry. And observing a fig tree some way off with his leaves out, he went up to see if he could find anything on it. But when he reached it, he found leaves and nothing else. It was not the right season for figs. And he said to it aloud in the hearing of his disciples, Let no man ever eat fruit of thine hereafter. So they came to Jerusalem, and there Jesus went into the temple and began driving out those who sold and bought in the temple and overthrew the tables of the bankers and the chairs of the pigeon sellers, nor would he allow anyone to carry his wares through the temple. And this was the admonition he gave them. Is it not written, My house shall be known among all the nations for a house of prayer, whereas you have made it into a den of thieves? The chief priests and scribes heard of this and were looking for some means of making away with him. They were afraid of him because all the multitude were so full of admiration at his teaching. He left the city at evening, and next morning, as they passed by, 
they saw the fig tree withered from its roots. Peter had not forgotten. Master, he said, look at the fig tree which thou didst curse. It has withered away. And Jesus answered them, Have faith in God. I promise you, if anyone says to this mountain, Remove and be cast into the sea, and has no hesitation in his heart, but is sure that what he says is to come about, his wish will be granted him. I tell you then, when you ask for anything in prayer, you have only to believe that it is yours, and it will be granted you. When you stand praying, forgive whatever wrong any man has done you, so that your Father who is in heaven may forgive you your transgressions. If you do not forgive, your Father who is in heaven will not forgive your transgressions either. So they came back to Jerusalem, and as he was walking about in the temple, the chief priests and scribes and elders came to him and asked him, What is the authority by which thou doest these things, and who gave thee this authority to do them? Jesus answered them, I too have a question to ask. If you can tell me the answer, I will tell you in return what is the authority by which I do these things. Whence did John's baptism come, from heaven or from men? Whereupon they cast about in their minds, if we tell him it was from heaven, they said, he will ask us, then why did you not believe him? And if we say it was from men, we have reason to be afraid of the people, for the people all looked upon John as a prophet indeed. And they answered Jesus, we cannot tell. Jesus answered them, and you will not learn from me what is the authority by which I do these things. Then he began to speak to them in parables. There was a man who planted a vineyard and put a wall round it, and dug a wine press and built a tower in it, and then let it out to some vine dressers while he went on his travels. And when the season came, he sent one of his servants on an errand to the vine dressers to claim from the vine dressers the revenue of his vineyard. Whereupon they took him and beat him and sent him away empty-handed. Then he sent another servant on a second errand to them, and him too they beat over the head and used him outrageously. He sent another whom they killed, and many others whom they beat or killed at their pleasure. He had still one messenger left, his own well-beloved son. Him he sent to them, last of all. They will have reverence, he said, for my son. But the vine dressers said among themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him, and then his inheritance will be ours. So they took him and killed him and cast him out of the vineyard. And now, what will the owner of the vineyard do? He will come and make an end of those vine dressers and give his vineyard to others. Why, have you not read this passage in the Scriptures? The very stone which the builders rejected has become the chief stone of the corner. This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvellous in our eyes. This parable they saw was aimed at themselves, and they would gladly have laid hands on him, but they were afraid of the multitude. So they went away and left him alone. Then they sent some of the Pharisees to him, with those who were of Herod's party, to make him betray himself in his talk. These came and said to him, Master, we know that thou art sincere, that thou holdest no one in awe, making no distinction between man and man, but teachest in all sincerity the way of God. Is it right that tribute should be paid to Caesar, or should we refuse to pay it? But he saw their treachery, and said to them, Why do you thus put me to the test? Bring me a silver piece, and let me look at it. When they brought it, he asked them, Whose is this likeness? whose name is inscribed on it? Caesar's, they said. Whereupon Jesus answered them, Give back to Caesar what is Caesar's, and to God what is God's. And they were lost in admiration of him. Then he was approached with a question by the Sadducees, men who say that there is no resurrection. Master, they said, Moses prescribed for us that if a man's brother dies, leaving a widow behind him, but no children, he, the brother, should marry the widow and beget children in the dead brother's name. There were seven brethren, 
The first married a wife and died childless. The second married her, and he too left no children, and so were the third. All seven married her without having children, and the woman died last of all. And now, when the dead rise again, which of these will be her husband, since she was wife to all seven? Jesus answered them, Is not this where you are wrong, that you do not understand the Scriptures, or what is the power of God? When the dead rise, there is no marrying or giving in marriage. They are as the angels in heaven are. But as for the dead rising again, have you never read in the book of Moses how God spoke to him at the burning bush and said, I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob? Yet it's of living men, not of dead men, that he's God. You are wrong then altogether. One of the scribes heard their dispute, and finding that he answered to the purpose, came up and asked him, Which is the first commandment of all? Jesus answered him, The first commandment of all is, Listen, Israel, there is no God but the Lord thy God, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with the love of thy whole heart and thy whole soul and thy whole mind and thy whole strength. This is the first commandment, and the second, its like, is this, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. There is no other commandment greater than these. And the scribe said to him, Truly, Master, thou hast answered well. There is but one God, and no other beside him. And to love him with the love of the whole heart, and the whole understanding, and the whole soul, and the whole strength, is a greater thing than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. Then Jesus, seeing how wisely he had answered, said to him, Thou art not far from the kingdom of God. And after that, no one dared to try him with further questions. Then Jesus said openly, still teaching in the temple, What do the scribes mean by saying that Christ is to be the son of David? David himself was moved by the Holy Spirit to say, The Lord said to my master, Sit on my right hand, while I make thy enemies a footstool under thy feet. Thus David himself calls Christ his master, how can he be also his son? And the multitude at large listened to him readily. This was part of the teaching he gave them. Beware of the scribes, who enjoy walking in long robes and having their hands kissed in the marketplace and the first seats in the synagogues and the chief places at feasts, who swallow up the property of widows under cover of their long prayers. Their sentence will be all the heavier for that. As he was sitting opposite the treasury of the temple, Jesus watched the multitude throwing coins into the treasury, the many rich with their many offerings. And there was one poor widow who came and put in two mites, which make a farthing. Thereupon he called his disciples to him and said to them, Believe me, this poor widow has put in more than all those others who put offerings into the treasury. The others all gave out of what they had to spare, she, with so little to give, put in all that she had, her whole livelihood. Before we start this next chapter, I want to put in a little note. In this chapter, our Lord is speaking of two events, the destruction of Jerusalem and the end of the world. It's rather like two exposures on the one negative. And at the end of the chapter, when he says that the Son of Man does not know when all this will take place, he is saying that it is no part of his messianic mission to reveal this information to men. In other words, this is a question that you should not ask. Here is the text. As he was leaving the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Look, Master, what stones, what a fabric! Jesus answered him, Do you see all this huge fabric? There will not be a stone of it left on another. It will all be thrown down. So when he was sitting down on Mount Olivet, opposite the temple, Peter and James and John and Andrew asked him, now that they were alone, Tell us, when will this be, and what sign will be given, when all this is soon to be accomplished? 
Take care, Jesus began in answer, that you do not allow anyone to deceive you. Many will come making use of my name. They will say, Here I am, and many will be deceived by it. When you hear tell of wars and rumors of wars, do not be disturbed in mind. Such things must happen, but the end will not come yet. Nation will rise in arms against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in this region or that, there will be famines. All this is but the beginning of travail. But you will have to think of yourselves. Men will be giving you up to courts of justice and scourging you in the synagogues. Yes, and you will be brought before governors and kings on my account, so that you can bear witness to them. The gospel must be preached to all nations before the end. When they take you and hand you over thus, do not consider anxiously beforehand what you are to say. Use what words are given you when the time comes. It is not you that speak, it is the Holy Spirit. Brother will be given up to death by brother, and the son by his father. Children will rise up against their parents and will compass their death. All the world will be hating you, because you bear my name. But that man will be saved who endures to the last. And now, when you see the abomination of desolation standing where it should never stand, let him who reads this recognize what it means. Then those who are in Judea must take refuge in the mountains, not going down into the house if they are on the house top, or entering the house to carry anything away from it, not turning back if they are in the fields to pick up a cloak. It will go hard with women who are with child, or who have children at the breast in those days. And you must pray that your flight may not be in the winter. For those will be days of distress, such as has not been since the beginning of creation till now, and can never be again. There would have been no hope left for any human creature if the Lord had not cut those days short. But he has cut the days short for the sake of the elect whom he has chosen. At such a time, if a man tells you, See, here is Christ, or see, he is there, do not believe him. There will be false Christs and false prophets who will rise up and show signs and wonders so that if it were possible, even the elect would be deceived. But you must be on your guard. Hereby I have given you warning of it all. In those days, after this distress, the sun will be darkened and the moon will refuse her light and the stars will be falling from heaven and the powers that are in heaven will rock. And then they will see the Son of Man coming upon the clouds with great power and glory. And then he will send out his angels to gather his elect from the four winds, from earth's end to heaven's. The fig tree will teach you a parable. When his branch grows supple and begins to put out leaves, you know that summer is near. So you, when you see all this come about, are to know that it is near at your very doors. Believe me, this generation will not have passed before all this is accomplished. Though heaven and earth should pass away, my words will stand. But as for that day and that hour you speak of, they are known to nobody, not even to the angels in heaven, not even to the Son. Only the Father knows them. Look well to it, watch and pray. You do not know when the time is to come. It is as if a man going on his travels had left his house, entrusting authority to his servants, each of them to do his own work, and enjoying the doorkeeper to watch. Be on the watch then, since you do not know when the master of the house is coming, at twilight, or midnight, or cockcrow, or dawn. If not, he may come suddenly and find you asleep. And what I say to you, I say to all, watch. It was now two days to the Paschal Feast and the time of unleavened bread, and the chief priests and scribes were trying to bring Jesus into their power by cunning and put him to death. But not on the day of the feast, they said, or there may be an uproar among the people. And then, while he was in the house of Simon the leper at Bethany, sitting at table, a woman came in with a pot of very precious spikenard ointment, which, first breaking the pot, she poured over his head. 
There were some present who were indignant when they saw it, and said among themselves, What did she mean by wasting the ointment so? This ointment might have been sold for three hundred pieces of silver, and alms might have been given to the poor, and they rebuked her angrily. But Jesus said, Let her alone, why should you vex her? She did well to treat me so. You have the poor among you always, so that you can do good to them when you will. I am not always among you. She has done what she could. She has anointed my body beforehand to prepare it for burial. I promise you, in whatever part of the world this gospel is preached, the story of what she has done shall be told in its place to preserve her memory. Then Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve, went to the chief priests and offered to betray him into their hands. And they, listening to him eagerly, promised him money, whereupon he looked about for an opportunity to betray him. On the first of the days of unleavened bread, the day on which they killed the paschal victim, his disciples asked him, Where wilt thou have us go and make ready for thee to eat the paschal meal? And he sent two of his disciples on this errand. Go into the city, and there a man will meet you, carrying a jar of water. You are to follow him, and say to the owner of the house into which he enters, The master says, Where is my room, in which I am to eat the paschal meal with my disciples? And he will show you a large upper room, furnished and prepared. It is there that you are to make ready for us. So the disciples left him and went into the city, where they found all as he had told them, and so made ready for the paschal meal. When it was evening, he came there with the twelve. And as they sat at table and were eating, Jesus said, Believe me, one of you, one who is eating with me, is to betray me. They began to ask him sorrowfully, each in turn, Is it I? And then another, Is it I? He told them, It is one of the twelve, the man who puts his hand into the dish with me. The Son of Man goes on his way, as the Scripture foretells of him. But woe upon that man by whom the Son of Man is to be betrayed. Better for that man if he'd never been born. And while they were still at table, Jesus took bread, and blessed, and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, Take this, this is my body. Then he took a cup and offered thanks and gave it to them, and they all drank of it. And he said, This is my blood of the New Testament, shed for many. I tell you truthfully, I shall not drink of this fruit of the vine again until the day when I drink it with you, new wine in the kingdom of God. And so they sang a hymn and went out to Mount Olivet. And Jesus said to them, Tonight, You will all lose courage over me, for so it has been written, I will smite the shepherd, and the sheep will be scattered. But I will go on before you into Galilee, when I have risen from the dead. Peter said to him, Though all else should lose courage over thee, I will never lose mine. And Jesus said to him, Believe me, this night, before the second cock crow, thou wilt thrice disown me. But Peter insisted more than ever, I will not disown thee, though I must lay down my life with thee. And all of them said the like. So they came to a plot of land called Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, Sit down here while I go and pray. But he took Peter and James and John with him. And now he grew dismayed and distressed. My soul, he said to them, is ready to die with sorrow. Do you abide here and keep watch? So he went forward a little and fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass him by. Abba, Father, he said, all things are possible to thee. Take away this chalice from before me, only as thy will is, not as mine is. Then he went back and found them asleep. And he said to Peter, Simon, art thou sleeping? Hadst thou not strength to watch even for an hour? Watch and pray, that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit is willing enough, but the flesh is weak. Then he went away and prayed again, using the same words. And when he returned, once more he found them asleep, so heavy their eyelids were. 
and he did not know what answer to make to him. When he came the third time, he said to them, Sleep and take your rest hereafter. Enough, the time has come. Behold, the Son of Man is to be betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise up, let us go on our way. Already he that is to betray me is close at hand. And thereupon, while he was yet speaking, Judas Iscariot, who was one of the twelve, came near. With him was a great multitude carrying swords and clubs, who had been sent by the chief priests and the scribes and the elders. The traitor had appointed them a signal. It is none other, he said, than the man whom I shall greet with a kiss. Hold him fast, and take him away under guard. No sooner then had he come up than he went close to Jesus, saying, Hail, Master, and kissed him. And with that they laid their hands on him and held him fast. And one of those who stood by drew his sword and smote one of the high priest's servants with it, cutting off his ear. Then Jesus said to them aloud, You've come out to my arrest with swords and clubs as if I were a robber, and yet I used to teach in the temple close to you day after day, and you never laid hands on me. But the scriptures must be fulfilled. And now all his disciples abandoned him and fled. There was a young man there following him, who was wearing only a linen shirt on his bare body, and he, when they laid hold of him, left the shirt in their hands and ran away from them naked. So they took Jesus into the presence of the high priest, and all the chief priests and elders and scribes were assembled about him. Yet Peter followed at a long distance, right into the high priest's palace, where he sat with the servants by the fire to warm himself. The high priest and all the council tried to find an accusation against Jesus, such as would compass his death, but they could find none. Many accused him falsely, but their accusations did not agree. There were some who stood up and falsely accused him thus. We heard him say, I will destroy this temple that's made by men's hands, and in three days I will build another with no hand of man to help me. But even so, their accusations did not agree. Then the high priest stood up and asked Jesus, Hast thou no answer to the accusations these men bring against thee? He was still silent, still did not answer. And the high priest questioned him again, Art thou the Christ, the Son of the Blessed God? Jesus said to him, I am. And you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of God's power and coming with the clouds of heaven. At this, the high priest tore his garments and said, What further need have we of witnesses? You have heard his blasphemy for yourselves. What is your finding? And they all pronounced against him a sentence of death. Then some of them fell to spitting upon him and covering his face while they buffeted him and bade him prophesy. The servants too caught him blows on the cheek. Meanwhile, Peter was in the court without, and one of the maid servants of the high priest came by. She saw Peter warming himself, and said, looking closely at him, Thou too was with Jesus the Nazarene. Whereupon he denied it. I know nothing of it. I do not understand what thou meanest. Then he went out into the porch, and the cock crew. Again, The maid looked at him and said to the bystanders, This is one of them. And again he denied it. Then, a little while afterwards, the bystanders said to Peter, It is certain that thou art one of them. Why, thou art a Galilean. And he fell to calling down curses on himself and swearing, I do not know the man you speak of. Then came the second cock crow. And Peter remembered the word Jesus had said to him. Before the second cock crow, Thou wilt thrice deny me. And all at once he burst out weeping. No sooner had day broken than the chief priests made their plans with the elders and scribes and the whole council. They took Jesus away in bonds and gave him up to Pilate. And Pilate asked him, Art thou the king of the Jews? He answered him, Thy own lips have said it. 
And now the chief priests brought many accusations against him. And Pilate questioned him again, Dost thou make no answer? See what a weight of accusations they bring against thee. But Jesus still would not answer him, so that Pilate was full of astonishment. At the festival he used to grant them the liberty of any one prisoner they chose, and the man they called Barabbas was then in custody with the rebels who had been guilty of murder during the rebellion. So when the multitude came up towards him and began to ask for the customary favour, Pilate answered them, Would you have me release the king of the Jews? He knew well that the chief priests had only given him up out of malice. But the chief priests incited the multitude to ask for the release of Barabbas instead. Once more Pilate answered them, What would you have me do then with the king of the Jews? And they made a fresh cry of, Crucify him. Why, Pilate said to them, What wrong has he done? But they cried all the more, Crucify him. And so Pilate, determined to humor the multitude, released Barabbas as they asked. Jesus he scourged and gave him up to be crucified. Then the soldiers led him away into the court of the palace and gathered there the whole of their company. They arrayed him in a scarlet cloak and put round his head a crown which they had woven out of thorns and fell to greeting him with, Hail, King of the Jews! And they beat him over the head with a rod and spat upon him and bowed their knees in worship of him. At last they had done with mockery, stripping him of the scarlet cloak they put his own garments on him and led him away to be crucified. As for his cross, they forced a passer-by who was coming in from the country to carry it, one Simon of Cyrene, the father of Alexander and Rufus. And so they took him to a place called Golgotha, which means the place of a skull. Here they offered him a draught of wine mixed with myrrh, which he would not take, and then crucified him dividing his garments among them by casting lots to decide which should fall to each. It was the third hour when they crucified him. When Senior Knox has put a footnote here, it is generally thought that St. Mark is here treating the space between nine o'clock and noon as a single stretch of time which he calls the third hour. We are not then to suppose that our Lord was nailed to his cross at nine o'clock and hung six hours upon it. If he was crucified at eleven, or even half-past eleven, it would still be during the third hour, in the sense that the sixth hour had not yet begun. I go back to the text. It was the third hour when they crucified him. A proclamation of his offence was written up over him, the king of the Jews. And with him they crucified two thieves, one on the right and the other on his left so fulfilling the words of Scripture, and he was counted among the wrongdoers. The passers-by blasphemed against him, shaking their heads. Come now, they said, thou who wouldst destroy the temple and build it up in three days. Come down from the cross and rescue thyself. In the same way, the chief priests and scribes said mockingly to one another, He saved others, he cannot save himself. Let Christ, the King of Israel, come down from the cross, here and now, so that we can see it and believe in him. And the men who were crucified with him uttered taunts against him. When the sixth hour came, there was darkness over all the earth until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Hearing this, some of those who stood by said, Why, he's calling upon Elias. And thereupon one of them ran off to fill a sponge with vinegar and fixed it on a rod and offered to let him drink. Wait, he said, let us see whether Elias is to come and save him. Then Jesus gave a loud cry and yielded up his spirit. and the veil of the temple was torn this way and that, from the top to the bottom. The centurion who stood in front of him, perceiving that he so yielded up his spirit with a cry, said, No doubt 
but this was the Son of God. There were women there who stood watching from far off. Among them were Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James the Less and of Joseph and Salome. These used to follow him and minister to him when he was in Galilee, and there were many others who had come up with him to Jerusalem. And now it was already evening. There's a footnote here I read. The body of a man who had been crucified must be taken down and buried before nightfall. But here early action was necessary because it was a Friday and after six o'clock in the evening the Sabbath would have begun so that the work of burial would have become unlawful. I'll go back to the text. And now it was already evening and because it was the day of preparation, that is, the day before the Sabbath, a rich counsellor named Joseph of Arimathea, one of those who waited for God's kingdom, boldly went to Pilate and asked to have the body of Jesus. Pilate, astonished that he should have died so soon, called the centurion to him to ask if he was dead already, and when he heard the centurion's report, gave Joseph the body. Joseph took him down and wrapped him in a winding sheet, which he'd bought, and laid him in a tomb cut out of the rock, rolling a stone against the door of the tomb. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, saw where he had been laid. And when the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Salome, had bought spices to come and anoint Jesus. So they came to the tomb very early on the day after the Sabbath at sunrise, and they began to question among themselves, Who is to roll the stone away for us from the door of the tomb? Then they looked up and saw that the stone, great as it was, had been rolled away already. And they went into the tomb and saw there on the right a young man seated, wearing a white robe, and they were dismayed. But he said to them, No need to be dismayed. You've come here to look for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has risen again. He is not here. Here is the place where they laid him. Go and tell Peter and the rest of his disciples that he is going before you into Galilee. There you shall have sight of him, as he promised you. So they came out and ran away from the tomb, trembling and awestruck, and said nothing to anyone out of fear. But he had risen again at dawn on the first day of the week, and showed himself first of all to Mary Magdalene, the woman out of whom he had cast seven devils. She went and gave the news to those who had been of his company, where they mourned and wept. And they, when they were told that he was alive and that she had seen him, could not believe it. After that he appeared in the form of a stranger to two of them as they were walking together, going out into the country. These went back and gave the news to the rest, but they did not believe them either. Then at last he appeared to all eleven of them as they sat at table, and reproached them with their unbelief and their obstinacy of heart in giving no credit to those who had seen him after he had risen. And he said to them, Go out over all the world and preach the gospel to the whole of creation. He who believes and is baptized will be saved. He who refuses belief will be condemned. Where believers go, these signs shall go with them. They will cast out devils in my name. They will speak in tongues that are strange to them. They will take up serpents in their hands and drink poisonous draughts without harm. They will lay their hands upon the sick and make them recover. And so the Lord Jesus, when he had finished speaking to them, was taken up to heaven and is seated now at the right hand of God. And they went out and preached everywhere, the Lord aiding them and attesting his word by the miracles that went with them. The End of this Gospel